G'day, my name's Chris Nixon, and today I'm going to talk to you about translational simulation, what it is, what it's useful for, and how you can do it. There's a URL on this title page, and you can click on that for further resources related to this talk. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Vic Brazel, Andrew Petrosoniak, and Stephanie Barwick, who were my co-authors on an article called Translational Simulation from Description to Action, and that very much is, provides a lot of the basis for this talk. But I'd also like to acknowledge all my colleagues at the Alfred ICU and the Alfred Simulation Centre who I've worked with on many translational simulation projects over the past six or so years. So before we begin, I want you to imagine that your ICU is faced with these three challenges. So firstly, Due to an increase in demand for ICU beds, your hospital has plans to expand the ICU. It's going to involve the opening of a new ICU pod with new clinical spaces that have never been used to look after ICU patients before. ICU leadership and frontline staff both worry a bit about whether these spaces will be fit for purpose and whether the insights of frontline workers will be used to inform the design of the space and also how it will all just integrate with the existing ICU service. But wait, there's more. There's been a cluster of risk mans concerning delays in uh, blood product administration over the past year. And massive transfusion isn't, doesn't happen very commonly in ICU, but you're very concerned about how you can make this process more efficient whilst ensuring maximum safety. And thirdly, there's been increasing reports of conflict between members of your ICU and one of the surgical units. There's rumours going around about cultural problems with each of the units. They both seem committed to high quality patient care. So you'd like to find a way to help the two units work together more effectively and to take care of their shared patients. Now, these sorts of situations are not unusual and you may have faced similar situations in the past. But I wonder, did you consider using translational simulation as part of the solution? And if the answer is no, I'd argue that you may have missed an important opportunity to have made things better. Before we figure out what translational simulation is, let's revisit what simulation is. And most of us will be familiar with simulation-based education. And this is a definition that uh, Garber provided in 2004, who was one of the pioneers of simulation-based medical education. So he says it's a technique to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences that evoke or replicate substantial aspects of the real world in a fully interactive manner. And traditionally, simulation has been classified by location, modality, and content. So location, where, where the simulation actually occurs, does it happen in the sim, sim lab or is it in situ in the workplace? Uh, the technology or modality that you're using, so is it a tabletop simulation? Are you using a high-tech mannequin or part task trainers or are you using patient actors as simulated patients? And of course, a different content uh, that's actually in the simulation, what type of scenarios they are. Well, translational simulation moves beyond all of this because it's completely agnostic as to where simulation is performed, the modality used, or the content of the simulation. It can, use, it can involve any of this. What's more important is the goal of the simulations that you're performing. Because translational simulation aims to directly improve patient care in healthcare systems. And it can do this by diagnosing safety and performance issues or by delivering simulation-based interventions. Now, there's another way of thinking about this. So if you think traditional simulation-based education targets learning by individuals or small patient or, or small groups, Translational simulation seeks to drive organisational learning by targeting simulation at a systems level with the ultimate goal always being better patient care or improved patient outcomes. 
So in general terms, there's kind of three main areas where translational simulation is often useful. The first is targeting specific patient care outcomes or performance indicators. The second is testing and designing processes of care or built environments. And the third is improving the quality of patient care through strengthening relationships and building culture. So let's look in more granular detail about examples from the literature uh, of how translational simulation can achieve these things. So an example of improved patient outcomes is that there's now a couple of studies showing that um, improved in-hospital cardiac arrest survival uh, correlates with more active in situ mock code participation. So the more uh, cardiac arrest simulations you do, um, improved, the more improved cardiac arrest survival is in hospitals. Similarly, there's a number of studies showing improved performance and quality of patient care, things like decreased door-to-needle times for stroke thrombolysis, things like decreased time to blood transfusion administration for trauma patients or decreasing the time patients spend in trauma day bays uh, before they go on to CT, and also studies showing improved trauma team teamwork and task completion scores. Other studies show that you can use translational simulation to improve compliance with quality improvement bundles and other process performance measures. As I've mentioned, translational simulation is great for testing and designing processes and also built environments. So there's a few studies now showing that in a lot of different environments, you can use in situ simulation to detect latent safety threats in the workplace. Uh, you can also use simulation to assess readiness of new hospitals or new uh, departments or services for opening. At the Alfred, we used it for uh, developing how our ECPR teams were going to work and the guidelines that they were going to follow. And others have um, uh, also used translational simulation for assessing latent safety threats with ECPR teams. Andrew Petrosoniak and colleagues have also published um, what they call design thinking informed simulation. So when you're designing a new process or clinical space, uh, simulation really slots in quite nicely in the design thinking phase of prototyping, where you can uh, rapidly change and modify a process, test it out and iteratively improve it. And finally, if you um, didn't use simulation as part of your pandemic preparedness, I'd suggest that you're, a, you're an outlier. And there's a bunch of studies out there now showing how uh, translational simulation has been used to prepare departments, hospitals, and even entire health systems for the COVID-19 pandemic. The third major area, culture and relationships. So I'd like to highlight a work by Victoria Brazel and her team in Queensland where they've been uh, creating a body of work now based around qualitative studies showing that translational simulation impacts hospital culture and improves relationships. And this includes things like uh, the development of shared goals and shared knowledge amongst uh, interprofessional trauma teams, improving communication of mutual respect, and how psychological safety in the simulation space can can support and improve some psychological safety in the workplace, but it can also work in reverse um, and negatively if things aren't done well. So translational simulation has pretty lofty objectives. And however it's done, we believe that it's more likely to be effective when it follows some important guiding principles. Firstly, it should have a systems approach, and that's because translational simulation typically is used to tackle complex problems with a whole bunch of different factors interacting to um, uh, create the situation. So a systems approach is more likely to uh, create meaningful and sustained impacts. 
Stakeholder involvement is critical. We need the right stakeholders at the right time. And that can include frontline workers and ideally even patients with a true participatory design and co-creation uh, model. Translational simulation should be a strategy, not an event. So what we mean by that is that it's not a one-off simulation and then it's done and dusted. Every time you do simulation, you're going to learn more things. It's an iterative process and, uh, and works best as an ongoing strategy. It should have a disciplined focus addressing a defined problem. And that's because we are unlikely to achieve our desired outcomes if, if we lack that focus. Although it is worth noting that the focus may shift over time or evolve iteratively as we learn more about the situation. And finally, functional task alignment, which means that we can choose any type of simulation activity really, but it just needs to be aligned with the desired objectives to achieve the desired outcomes. It doesn't matter about the location, the modality or the content so long as it's fit for purpose. So I'm going to describe now an operational framework for how you can actually deliver translational simulation. And it's really based on uh, what's evolved over the past few years in terms of how we do it at the Alfred. And it's very much mirrored by uh, the approaches used by my colleagues in the Gold Coast in uh, Queensland, the Mater in Brisbane, and also in Toronto, Canada. And this is what we uh, published in our paper. We've broken it down into a three-phase input process output model that I'll uh, talk you through now. And it kind of provides a roadmap for putting the theory of translational simulation into action. So first is the input phase, and what's that really about is making sure that we understand the problem and whether translational simulation is the right approach, so that we're not treating everything as a nail and just hitting it with the translational simulation hammer. So we need to spend a lot of time defining the problem by collecting information from all relevant sources, and we really want to empathise with frontline workers. See work through their eyes so that we can understand as best as possible work is actually done. And from there we can ideate about the possible underlying factors contributing to a problem or start thinking about what solutions we might be able to come up with for addressing them. And so by the end of this we really need to be able to answer Donald Berwick's key question for any quality improvement endeavour, what are we trying to accomplish? From there, we need to consider whether translational simulation is actually the correct approach because it's not a panacea and there's many other methods for improving patient care, such as ensuring adequate staffing and training and also traditional QI methods such as auditing and workplace interventions using a PDCA cycle. And it may well be that the answer is actually to use translational simulation alongside other strategies as part of a multi-pronged approach. And so if we are going to use translational simulation, we want to decide on our initial focus. Is it diagnostic, interventional, or both? By diagnosis, we seek to identify the underlying factors contributing to a problem. And by intervention, we're seeking to address these factors or creating solutions to the problem. And before launching, we want to review the project, make sure we don't need to revise or reject our proposal. And there's a whole bunch of things to consider here. Cost and resource availability. Is the organisation ready for this project? Is it going to be receptive? What are the opportunity costs? As well as uh, many other considerations. Next, we move on to the process phase of translational simulation. And this involves simulation design and delivery and data collection and analysis. Now, the design of simulation activities is pretty much bread and butter for simulation-based educators. But in translational simulation, we need to consider the wide range of um, simulation activities that we can provide, including how many we should provide and uh, using different modalities, scenarios, and locations for simulation appropriately. 
it's also really important in simulation delivery that we have the right team personnel um, delivering the simulation, but also the right people involved in the simulation. Um, we also need to pay special attention to the learning conversations around this, so how we pre-brief and debrief the simulation activities. And there's a whole bunch of tools and resources that we, you can use to help with this. So in terms of who actually takes part, this is really important. Because, for instance, if we're using um, a high-fidelity uh, simulation using authentic teams, we want to make sure that we've got the right people doing the right roles. So ICU nurses doing ICU roles. And we also should have matched observers, so another ICU nurse observing what they're doing because they'll see things uh, slightly differently as an observer. But you also may want other content expertise. So if IT is involved, you want, might want to have an IT expert observing. You might need even an architect or um, an engineer involved if it's something involving the clinical space. Uh, the next step is data collection and analysis. And this is another area where translational simulation differs quite a lot from simulation-based education. Uh, we need to make sure that our approaches are aligned with the objectives of translational simulation and also the intended outcomes. And we need to consider the skill set required of the team, the types of data we're going to collect, is that quantitative or qualitative or both, what methods we're going to use and the tools and resources required. And many of the tools and strategies that we can use for data collection analysis can be borrowed from existing quality improvement and human factors ergonomics approaches. But there's also more simulation specific tools emerging, things like the PEARLS systems integration framework for debriefing, the SAFI approach, approach to debriefing based around evidence based design principles, um, and so on. Once we get to uh, the output stage, we need to consider how we're going to report and disseminate findings and solutions, and then ultimately review our whole translational simulation process. So when we report and disseminate information, we need to think about the target audience, what information they should receive, and how they should receive it. Because it's going to be different for ICU leadership, for the frontline workers involved in the simulation, and if you're going to present more publicly in journal articles or press releases. And the re review phase is always important because you always learn from the translational simulation project that you've just done, and that will have implications for future projects. As I've gone through this, it may have seemed quite linear, but I just want to emphasise that it's very much an iterative process. You're always revisiting the problem, the focus, based on what you learn through repeated simulation activities. And that's really the key to success, is to use what you learn as you go. So finally, I'd like to conclude by um, highlighting really that translational simulation can improve patient care in healthcare systems. And hopefully that you now feel like you have an understanding of what translational simulation actually is, what can be achieved, and uh, appreciate that there's a roadmap for how you can do it. But I expect that much will change in the coming years as translational simulation evolves. And so I invite you to watch this space because there's certainly much to learn. Just remember, if you want to learn more, uh, visit the URL provided on the slide um, for more readings, more resources about translational simulation. Thank you very much.